So I have the honor now of introducing our guest speaker, Congressman French Hill. Um, we welcome you to the National War College. I believe this is your first visit um, to the National War College, but not to McNair uh, or to the National Defense University. As you've read in, in your program, uh, Congressman Hill lives in Little Rock and is the uh, he represents the second congressional district. You can see by the bio that his background is in economics. Uh, and he does serve on financial committees uh, and subcommittees uh, and is in the, in the leadership as well. What you don't see necessarily in there um, are the other associations that he has and the interests that, uh, that he takes up. He's on, he has multiple caucus memberships, which include uh, the Army, the, the Air Force, missile defense that he's all a part of, multiple foreign relations caucuses that he is a part of as well, and interesting the Historic Preservation Caucus as well. Now you put all of that together um, of the, the military, the historic, um, the uh, foreign affairs uh, areas. Um, it, it, it really brings about everything we've been talking about. And he's a practitioner because he has practiced using economics as a part of our national strategy as well. And, and so you think about the interagency approaches that we teach and, and uh, utilize uh, here. Congressman Hill is really, really does represent that. Importantly, though, as I was pondering, which I was taught to do at the National War College, um, uh, I was pondering why would a congressman from Arkansas have such an interest in uh, Theodore Roosevelt? Because we got his name from none other than Tweed Roosevelt. When we were thinking about who, who, would, who would speak on this occasion to talk about the laying of the cornerstone and try to relate that to the transition that we're in today um, and what we are, are facing. Tweed didn't hesitate. He said, French Hill, okay, uh, I'll talk to him. And so I had a moment before we came in just to ask Congressman um, where this interest in, in Roosevelt came from and uh, how that all developed and the relationship with Tweed. Uh, and, and what I learned it actually made, made a lot of sense. Uh, first, he is a, a student of history. And he was walking down the street one day, um, fell in step with an author who had written the definitive um, series on Roosevelt um, and dove in to it. And from that, uh, became a member of uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Foundation with, uh, with Tweed and with whom we have developed a very strong uh, relationship over the last couple of years. So Congressman, we're delighted to have you here. Um, we look forward to your remarks and uh, perhaps in the middle of it, we may have a Roosevelt arrive as well. <laughs> Appreciate that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, good afternoon. It's a delight to be with you, delight to be in historic uh, Roosevelt Hall. It is true in my executive branch experience, I know something about interagency coordination, something that's taught very ably here at the War College in the Defense uh, University. I described uh, those two years working for President Bush, 41 is a real effort in being a referee. I worked for Secretary of Treasury Brady and ran the Economic Policy Council on the White House staff which he translated in, I don't want to participate in meetings with certain cabinet officers, you get to do that. So <laughs> I know a lot about uh, policy coordination. Well, it's a treat to be here and I want to thank the Commandant uh, for the invitation to be with you and uh, General Maples, thank you for your kind introduction and it's a, it's a real, real treat to be on at Fort McNair. 116 years ago this week, President Theodore Roosevelt was present for the laying of the historic cornerstone that we've talked so much about this afternoon. A large crowd of dignitaries, officials, and troops assembled, assembled in honor of George Washington's birthday to inaugurate the Army War College and commence the work on this magnificent building. Instead, designed in the Beaux-Arts style by McKim Mead and White, Roosevelt Hall joined other outstanding examples of their work in Washington and New York, including New York Penn Station, Columbia University, and of course, the west and east wings of the White House. We stand on hallowed ground as this strategic and historic Washington Arsenal site is our third oldest army post uh, together with Carlisle Barracks and West Point. For his part, President Roosevelt was from a very young age, 
a student of strategy and military tactics. Two years after graduation from Harvard at age 24, Roosevelt offered, authored The Naval War of 1812. The book went through four editions in the first six years. And in 1886, just four years after being published, the Navy saw to it that a copy of the book was placed aboard every ship. This work was considered the definitive account of British and American naval tactics in the War of 1812. A significant point of the work was to criticize the lack of American preparedness. T.R. was relentless in his critique of Presidents Jefferson and Madison and their lack of preparation in run-up to the War of 1812. In his lecture entitled Washington's Forgotten Maxim at the Naval War College in June 1897 as a newly minted Assistant Secretary of Navy, Roosevelt attacked those who refused to prepare due to the, quote, short-sightedness of many, quote, the sheer ignorance of a vast number, and, quote, the selfish reluctance to ensure against future danger by present sacrifice among yet others. He left no one out of who was unprepared for the War of 1812. But likewise, he found equally, if not more reprehensible, the contemptible war hawks who, quote, brought on the war yet deliberately refused to make preparations necessary to carry it on to a successful conclusion. Roosevelt concluded that the War of 1812, quote, bitterly did the nation pay for its want of foresight and forethought. Roosevelt would devote his adult life to studying and lecturing on preparedness as the best way to avoid war. Starting with his work on the War of 1812 and ending in his sharp rebuke of President Woodrow Wilson in the run-up to World War I. Roosevelt's columns in 1916 and 1917 were, were just replete with lectures on what he called broomstick preparedness. And that's because the Army had no carbines and they drilled with broomsticks in the run-up to World War I. Roosevelt would cite one of our first president's principal maxims at every opportunity. George Washington wrote Eldridge Gerry on January 29, 1780, There is nothing so likely to produce peace as well to be well prepared to meet an enemy. This maxim was not forgotten by Teddy Roosevelt. By the time Roosevelt was confirmed as McKinley's Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897, he was fully engaged promoting the, war, the, the uh, role of sea power as a strategic American activity. The Naval War College, where Roosevelt delivered his aforementioned June 1897 talk, was the nerve center of American strategic planning and a place where naval officers went to advance their knowledge of science and history and tactics of marine warfare. T.R. was not alone in his concern over America's preparedness to George Washington's maxim. Roosevelt kept President McKinley's competent and highly respected Secretary of War, Elihu Root, and equally regarded Secretary of State, John Hay. Root had been a longtime TR supporter, having assisted him in his earliest run for the New York Assembly and for New York governor. Along the way, Root edited Roosevelt's speeches and Roosevelt greatly enjoyed Root's deadly wit. T.R. believed that Root could succeed him as president if he were not so tightly associated with New York and Wall Street. For his part, the secretary believed that the Army staff had grown bloated and subject to the whims of the general officers and their personal preferences. Further, there was criticism of the Army's ineptness during the Spanish-American War. Secretary Root had long argued for the idea of a general staff for the United States Army, a chief of staff reporting to the Secretary of War, and increased professional education. In November 1899, Roosevelt published a column in the Century, which outlines that ineptness during the Spanish-American War. Roosevelt put it this way, The mistakes, the blunders, and the shortcomings in the Army management during the summer of 1898 should be credited mainly, not to anyone in office in 1898, but to the public servants of the people, 
and therefore to the people themselves who permitted the army to rust since the Civil War with a wholly faulty administration and with no chance whatsoever to perfect itself by practice, any trouble that may have come upon the army and therefore upon the nation in the next few years will be due to the failure to provide for a thoroughly reorganized regular army of adequate size in 1898. That's how Roosevelt spoke. I don't know how he got through English classes. <laughs> it's a run-on sentence. And for this failure in the Senate and the House who took the lead against increasing the regular army and reorganizing it, they will be primarily responsible. So Roosevelt personally, is, as he became an Assistant Secretary of Navy, began to really advocate for these changes. And he compared it to what was going on at the Navy. When complimenting the Navy's performance during the Spanish-American War, T.R. credited the administration of President Arthur, who in 1883 initiated the serious strategic work to build a properly sized and equipped Navy. Roosevelt argued this contrasted mightily with the state of the Army. T.R. bluntly described the state of the Army in that same article. The bureaus in Washington were absolutely enmeshed in red tape and were held for the most part by elderly men of fine records in the past who were no longer fit to break through routine and show the extraordinary energy, business capacity, initiative, and willingness to accept responsibility as that which was needed. Finally, the higher officers had been absolutely denied their chance to practice their profession which the higher offices of the Navy had been long accustomed. And so this was the idea of maneuvers, having joint force exercises that the Navy had initiated uh, years before. Adding to the frustration was the fact that in the aftermath of the Civil War, General Sherman had commissioned Major General Emory Upton, then a colonel of the 4th Artillery, to study the armies of Europe and Asia. His recommendations included the formation of a general staff and a systematic extension of military education. Upton's comprehensive report, directed by General Sherman, sat on the shelves in Washington and collected dust for decades. Knowing all of this, Roosevelt concluded his opinion piece by arguing that Congress had failed to make adequate provision for a proper army and to provide for the reorganization of the Army for its practice in time of peace. The whole staff system and much else should be remodeled, he argued. There is no doubt that this fully reflected the strong professional opinions of President McKinley's Secretary of War route. Flash forward to 1900 and the re-election of William McKinley as President. McKinley, against the advice of many, named the hero of San Juan Heights the former governor of New York, Theodore Roosevelt, as his running mate. In a state of shock to the nation in September 1901, McKinley is assassinated while visiting Buffalo, New York. And Roosevelt, at age 42, takes the oath of office as our 26th president of the United States. On December 3rd, 1901, Roosevelt sent his first annual message to the Congress. It was an intensive, long, detailed list of Roosevelt ideas for Congress's consideration. In those days, we didn't have a State of the Union speech. The President sent up his annual message, as was suggested in the Constitution, and it was read to both chambers. And on that day, the clerks read themselves hoarse. Over the course of two and a half hours, it took to read the message in each chamber. I can tell you as an aside that each year the members got less and less interested hearing from President Roosevelt, and in 1909, in his last uh, annual message to the Congress, they voted to table it. They just couldn't, they, <laughs> they didn't, I don't think they heard it all the way out. In that first message, the president that a general staff should be created and that it should be, uh, there should be a criteria for the promotion of officers, not just based on seniority. He believed that thorough, thorough military education for regulars, the National Guard, and others in civilian life who desire to prepare for military duty was essential. In his second message to Congress in December of the following year, 
Roosevelt referred to the need for a general staff as urgent. So it's gone from a recommendation to, I'm not kidding you, I want it. After years of passionate advocacy, Roosevelt and Root finally witnessed the formation of a general staff and secured approval for the creation of the Army War College here at the Washington Arsenal site. On that cold February Saturday in 1903, as the cornerstone was laid, Roosevelt told the assembled troops and guests, the exercises of the barrack and the parade ground do not make 5% of the soldier's real work. In his real efficiency, officer and man alike must be trained to the highest point in theory and in the practice of the profession. The Army of the United States is, and it is not desirable that it should be other than a small army relatively to the population of the country, but we have a right to expect that that small army shall represent for its size the very highest point of efficiency of an army, any army, in the civilized world. As a member of Congress, I was pleased that the 115th Congress, just ended, took to heart President Washington's maxim and President Roosevelt's passion by agreeing to fully fund the Department of Defense priorities and training and the enhancement of the National Guard, as well as in our forward-looking improvements in our uniform, both in an efficiency and in weapon systems, anticipating all forms of future conflicts. The budget cuts and sequester policies of the previous administration left our men and women in uniform inadequately supplied, substantial portions of our air assets grounded, and critically needed training curtailed. I saw that firsthand as I represent Little Rock Air Force Base, the Center of Excellence for Air Mobility, and Camp Joe T. Robinson, the National Center for Field Training and Executive Education for the Army uh, National Guard. It's fitting that during the 1903 George Washington Birthday Week, an impressive Masonic ceremony of laying the Roosevelt Hall cornerstone took place. Masonic Grand Master Walker spread the mortar for the cornerstone of this building with the very trowel used by George Washington to lay the cornerstone of the U.S. Capitol in 1793. More importantly today, we salute the persistence of President Roosevelt, Secretary of War Root, and we the assembles recommit that on our watch, George Washington's maxim of peace through strength will not be forgotten. Thanks very much for having me today. Would you take a few questions? Sure. Okay, we're going to uh, Lulu will pass the microphone around. And if you have a question, just hold up your hand. We'll, we'll get it to you. Please wait to ask uh, your question until you get the microphone so we can record it on C SPAN. So much. I'm just curious, were there other sites considered, or was this always the, the location that they, they had in mind for the War College? Based on my reading, uh, it was they wanted Washington, D.C., and this was the logical uh, site uh, for the convenience and the fact that they wanted it to be a, you know, a comprehensive site, not connected to West Point, because this was to continue education and broaden that education to not only the Guard, but as President Roosevelt speaks, those in civilian life who might uh, move to a military career at some point. How early was this named Theodore Roosevelt Hall? How early? It was, uh, to, it was I think, dedicated. I'll, I'll yield to my historian. I think it was dedicated as Roosevelt Hall uh, on that day. So it was named for the president at, upon its uh, erection, completion. Uh, Sir Paul Thompson from Penn State, uh, former student here. Same seat, so I'm glad that's still there. <laughs> um, oh, oh, never, they never break. <laughs> so glad that uh, you brought George Washington to all this because I always felt when I was here he deserved to be the, mm. one of the major uh, you know, people we always think about when we think about strategy and uh, success and so forth. So, but my question is, and I recall, maybe Janet knows this, but I recall a senator, maybe it was Senator... Um, 
uh, Truman coming over and listening to the lectures that were here. Right. Was that who it was, Janet? Yeah. The, actually, we've got pictures in our history yeah. of the of President Truman. Mm -hmm. Actually, was vice had, was already president. He came over to this auditorium, and I always thought that it it there was a picture of it because there's two things that struck me about it. One is he came to learn. So he sat with everyone else in the auditorium at the time we were trying to understand, have a better understanding, not only of the lessons of World War II, but again, what was Stalin up to. The second thing is when you look at the picture, he's walking up the steps and you're looking, there was only one car. I don't know if he drove over by himself or he had one Secret Service person with him, but there was no entourage, there was no, you know, tons and tons of folks, it was just Truman by himself. The other thing that I remember about the, reading about that time that I wish we could bring back, because I think we all feel that this is a little island of calmness in, in, in Washington, that at the time, um, Vandenberg and other congressional leaders also came to lecture. And afterwards, Admiral Hill, in his one of the general officer houses, would invite members of the Congress, both parties, quietly without press, to have lunch. And so the speaker would maybe address everybody in the hall. There would be questions and answers with the students, many of whom were World War II. We had general officers as, stu as students, right, in the first two classes. They would go to Admiral Hill's house. And I always believed that the, the bipartisan support for strategy that lasted all the years of the Cold War started here because they had a chance to learn together, ask questions without the press, to say, how can we get a better understanding of Marxism, of Stalin, and that that bipartisan trust started at lunch, well, here in learning, and at lunch over at, the, at Admiral Hill's house. So I, I, still, I always had this romantic notion, we can bring this back, you're, you're invited to lunch anytime you want to come, but that, that the Hill could use this as a refuge from all the politics because there are so many new things on our plate right now that we all need to ponder about. Well, I think, that's, I think all that's true, and I think uh, members uh, relish uh, interaction with uh, students, uh, certainly students at the National Defense University and the War College. I'm always uh, uh, pleased to come here and uh, participate in the uh, National University's uh, economics class that I've uh, been a guest lecturer for over the last four years, and the questions are terrific from people from the civilian side and the uniform side, and then our foreign military officers that are are here. It's always a diverse set of questions, and the interaction's terrific. So I hope you'll continue to invite members to come participate in on campus uh, with your activities. And that was part of the reason for my for my question was that, was that uh, you'd continue to come over here, and some of your colleagues would. And I also understand this building also is is the site for Congress to come to in case of a crisis or an emergency. So well, I know in the Republican conference, we, uh, we had a, a, one of our planning meetings in the uh, beautiful auditorium uh, in the new building. And uh, so we're, we're not strangers to the, to the campus. Yeah. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure, thanks for the invitation. And uh, here's to Theodore Roosevelt. Yay. Cheers. Cheers.